up till now we looked at the antenna as a source of electromagnetic wave that is we excited the antenna with a current and the effect of that was the radiation the antenna is used for transmitting electromagnetic energy but as we said at the beginning antenna is a transducer which converts the electrical quantities like voltage and current into the electromagnetic fields and vice versa that is electromagnetic quantities like electric and magnetic fields to the voltage and current today we investigate the characteristics of an antenna as a receiving transducer that means when an electromagnetic wave is incident on an antenna what kind of currents and voltages are induced in the antenna how much power is received by the antenna what kind of response the antenna has to incoming electromagnetic wave as a function of direction as a function of polarization these are the questions essentially we will investigate in this topic what is called the receiving antenna and then we will also define some relationship between the parameters of the transmitting and the receiving antenna that means if you take an antenna and if you use that antenna for transmitting purpose and if you use the same antenna for the reception purpose how the parameters of the transmitting and receiving antenna are related some derivations will be carried out in this lecture the properties of a transmitting and receiving antenna are related through what is called the reciprocity theorem the theorem as such is beyond the scope of this this course however just to get a gist of what the theorem says the theorem says is that whatever properties the antenna has while it was in transmitting mode the same properties it would have in the receiving mode also what it means is if the antenna had certain directions for maximum power that means antenna was putting more power into certain directions when the same antenna is used for reception purpose the antenna will be capable of receiving more power from that direction compared to other direction when it was transmitting less power while transmitting more also if i look at the electric field and if i change the direction of the electric field keeping the direction of the wave same then as the electric field changes essentially the polarization is changing and because of that the voltage induced into the antenna terminals will vary and the power delivered to the load connect to the antenna terminals will vary so we will have a response of the antenna to the incoming polarization also so again as from the reciprocity theorem the antenna will respond maximally to that polarization which it is capable of transmitting that means antenna has a state of polarization and that's what we had said would be the state of polarization of the incoming wave to be the antenna respond maximally when we discuss the topic of polarization so the polarization characteristics also are same identical for the transmitting and receiving antenna so as we said the reciprocity theorem is beyond the level of this course however what we will do is we will try to validate these arguments which reciprocity theorem puts forward that the antenna would have the same behavior while receiving as it was in transmitting and that we can see for a simple dipole which we have investigated that is the hertz dipole so we see now the characteristics of the receiving antenna and let us say if i have a hertz dipole of some small length dl some voltage is going to get generated between the terminals of this antenna let us say this voltage is called the voc open circuit voltage now if the wave which is a uniform plane wave is incident on this antenna and let us say the wave comes from this direction so this is the direction of the wave and this is a transverse electromagnetic wave so you have a electric field which will be this this is e let us say the dipole is oriented in the z direction as you have taken earlier so the wave is incident on this from an angle which is angle theta with respect to z axis now due to this electric field you have 
E dot dl, so there is a voltage induced between this wire, piece of wire is the Hertz dipole and that is the dot product of dl which is the length of the dipole and the electric field. So, as we can see from here the E dot dl the voltage V O C that will be equal to E dot dl where dl is the length of the antenna. So, here this is this length is dl. If this angle is theta then the angle which it makes with the z axis is 90 minus theta. So, the dot product of these two that is the open circuit voltage will be the electric field E d L into cos of pi by 2 minus theta that is equal to E d L into sin theta. That means, when the wave is incident from this direction when theta is equal to 90 degrees the theta will be equal to 90 degrees. So, this quantity is 1. So, you will have a maximum voltage induced between the terminals of the antenna. Whereas, when the wave is incident from this direction when theta equal to 0 or theta equal to pi that time the voltage induced between the terminals of the antenna would be 0. So, then I can say that the reception pattern for this Hertz dipole will be having a directional dependence which will be sin theta. So, it will it will get a maximum induction from the wave which is coming from the direction theta equal to 90 degrees that is perpendicular to it. And when the wave comes along along the axis of the antenna then the induced voltage will be 0 because dot product will be 0. So, if you recall precisely same variation the antenna had while transmitting that is the radiation pattern of this antenna was sin, sin of theta for the earth's dipole. So, this quantity sin of theta which tells me now the variation of the open circuit voltage for this antenna as a function of the angle of the incoming uniform plane wave incident on this antenna that variation is sin theta. So, we have a validation that is the radiation characteristic or what we call radiation pattern for a transmitting antenna is identical to the directional dependence of the re receiving antenna. So, this antenna is capable of giving you maximum field in theta equal to 90 degree direction. So, it receives also maximally from that direction. It does not put any radiation field in along the axis of the dipole. So, it does not receive also any field from the axis of the dipole. One can now say what will what is the effect of the polarization on this. So, again let us say suppose the electric field was perpendicular to the plane of the paper. This electric field when it comes here this is perpendicular to the Hertz dipole. So, E dot d L is identically 0. So, when the E is perpendicular to this you have the dot product equal to 0. So, no voltage is induced. You will have a voltage induced only by that component of the electric field which lies in the plane of the paper because that is the one which is going to give you dot product with this. The component of the electric field which is perpendicular to the plane of the paper will give me the dot product 0 because the angle between this electric field and d L will be always 0. So, what we see that as I go on a given distance from the dipole if I if I draw a, a circle now like that around this and if I imagine a situation that the wave is coming from different directions. So, at a distance r from the Hertz dipole if I take various waves which are coming and impinging on this, this field will give me the voltage, this field will be here the field will be like that for incoming wave. So, it will give me the voltage which is maximum that is what is given by this. And no, there is no voltage induced because of the electric field which has a component which is perpendicular to this. So, this is precisely the behavior that now your antenna is responding to only theta component of the electric field which is tangential to this circle. If you take electric field which is perpendicular to this then 
the induced voltage is equal to 0. Precisely that is the behavior we see for the transmitting antenna that the Hertz dipole used to radiate an electric field which was linearly polarized and it was linear polarization was in the direction theta. So, here also we see the Hertz dipole response to the incoming electric field which is oriented along theta. So, the polarization characteristic also is identical for the transmitting and receiving antenna. So, in fact, this property is true for any general antenna though we saw its validity for the Hertz dipole. In fact, when we go in practice you take any antenna and its radiation pattern will be identical while well, receiving and transmitting mode, its polarization behavior also will be identical while transmitting and receiving mode. That means an antenna will respond maximally to that polarization to which it is capable of transmitting. Having understood now this behavior, then there is one parameter which is very special to the receiving antenna, which cannot be defined for transmitting antenna. And that is what is called the effective aperture of the antenna. Now, the idea is as follows. Let us say I have an antenna which was when it was used in a transmitting mode. So, let us say I have a general antenna which it was transmitting mode. So, when I saw from the circuit point of view between the terminals of this antenna, we see an impedance which is the input impedance of the antenna which is z. So, from the circuit point of view, this is equivalent to a an impedance which is some resistance value which is equal to the radiation resistance of the antenna. So, R plus J x. So, an antenna which is seen from the circuit point of view between the terminals appear like an impedance where R is a measure of how much power is radiated by the antenna and x essentially is related to the reactive field, the inductance and the electrostatic field which are around the antenna. So, the power radiated by the antenna is essentially related to this quantity r. Now, again by the reciprocity theorem, essentially the impedance between the terminals of the antenna is identical when antenna was transmitting and the receive. That means, if I now while receiving if I look between the terminals of the antenna, this will appear like a voltage source because the voltage is induced between the terminals that is the V open circuit voltage with an internal impedance which is the same as the antenna impedance which is R plus J x. So, if I take now an antenna, so this was the case which was transmitting. Transmitting antenna. If I take the antenna which is receiving antenna, then we have a situation. This is the antenna on which now the wave is incident and this antenna now is connected to a, a load impedance to which the power is to be delivered and let us say this load is given by Z L. So, this antenna now is equivalent to a open circuit voltage which is induced between the terminals of the antenna. So, I have here a voltage source which is V O C. Then I have an internal impedance of this antenna which is R plus x. So, this is R plus J x and this is connected to the load impedance to which the signal is received. So, this impedance is equal to Z L. So, if I see from circuit point of view a receiving antenna is equivalent to an open circuit voltage that is the voltage which you will measure between the open circuit terminals of the antenna. The internal impedance of the antenna is the same impedance which you would measure between the terminals of the antenna when antenna is in transmitting mode and that is the load impedance to which finally, the signal is delivered in the receiving mode. So, a receiving antenna 
can be equivalently represented by this circuit. Then the power which is delivered to, to this antenna is whenever there is a complex conjugate of this one, that is where the power is maximally delivered to this. So, now let us assume that everything is perfectly matched that is the wave which is incident on the antenna is coming from that direction for which the antenna has a maximum response. The polarization of the wave is adjusted in such a way that I get a maximum response. The load impedance is chosen in such a way that I have a complex conjugate match. That means, that is the maximum power I can extract from this wave to this load. So, from this antenna under every match condition polarization, direction of maximum radiation and the complex conjugate load I get the maximum power. So, I can say the maximum power delivered to the load load under fully matched condition and fully matched condition means direction of maximum radiation, the polarization and the complex conjugate match. Then the maximum power which you can extract will be equal to the V O C square divided by 4 R. I can just find out the current from here and then multiply by the voltage across this by conjugate of the current, I will get the power delivered to the load. So, now I can ask a question, the wave which is incident on this antenna has a power density what is called the pointing vector and this antenna has extracted a power which is P L that is the power which is made available to the load which is connected to the antenna. So, if I take a ratio of this power which is delivered to the load by the pointing vector of this wave which is incident on the antenna which has a unit of watts per meter square, I get a quantity which has a dimension of area. That quantity then I call is the effective aperture of my antenna receiving antenna. So, we say that if S is the power density of the wave then the effective aperture A e will be equal to the power delivered to the load under fully match condition divided by the power density of the wave. So, this aperture is telling as if when the wave was coming which I have certain power density and let us say I had a piece. So, I can cut a piece from this wave. So, I got some power from that area. The antenna essentially effectively put that piece and cuts a, a piece from this wave front which is coming in and that is the one which sort of is delivered the power to the load. So, this effective aperture in some cases is related to the physical area of the antenna, but by and large we cannot have a very direct relationship between the effective aperture and the physical area of the antenna. For example, when I take a thin antenna like a dipole, the physical area is extremely small but I will still have the effective aperture which will be substantial because this can still deliver the power to the load. So, this is a parameter which is a very unique parameter to the receiving antenna because this quantity is not there for transmitting antenna. And then it would be interesting to find out what is the relationship of this effective aperture with the parameters of the transmitting antenna. And I knew for transmitting antenna other than direction of maximum and radiation pattern there was a quantity called directivity, which used to tell us the focusing power of an antenna in a given direction. It would be then interesting to ask a question 
does it have any relation to the effective aperture or vice and, and vice versa that means are the directivity and effective aperture related in some sense if i make a physical antenna like a parabolic dish yes larger the antenna i make the antenna beam becomes smaller so directivity increases and since this antenna parabolic dish has a large physical area it appears as if it would have given you a larger effective area so increasing the size of a parabolic dish antenna would give me higher directivity it would give me the higher effective area also so it looks intuitively possible that the effective area and directivity they are in direct proportion in some sense because if one when one increases the other quantity also is is increasing especially that's what it looks like for the parabolic dish so what we do now we essentially derive a general relation of the effective aperture and the directivity of an antenna when the antenna was in receiving and the transmitting mode so for that let us again go to the circuit model of the antenna so let us say i have an antenna which is the transmitting antenna to which some voltage v1 is given because of that some currents flow so let us say this antenna is given by 1 then at some distance i have a receiving antenna and at the moment i am not even specifying what type of antenna it is let us take general case so i have some antenna here which is radiating i have another antenna here which is receiving and let us say this antenna is antenna 2 so this is the receiving antenna and through radiation and other field you have here a coupling between these two antennas so let us say there is some distance r between these two antennas and you are having here a coupling through radiation so the receiving antenna will essentially develop some voltage across the terminals which will be connected to the load and power will be delivered to the load we can write down the equivalent circuit of this so when i say v1 voltage is applied to this some i1 current is going to flow and the impedance internal impedance of the antenna is z1 so this is equivalent to an impedance which is z1 so i have voltage here which is v1 because of there some current flows between the antenna terminals which is i1 and this impedance is z1 and the effect of the coupling of the field between these two can be taken accounted for by electrical parameter what is called the mutual impedance between these two so i have between these two a quantity called mutual impedance let us say this is z mutual and on the receiving side we have a voltage which is voc then it will have a internal impedance of the antenna which is say z2 and it is connected to a load which is the complex conjugate of z2 so this is z2 conjugate so a two antenna system one receiving one transmitting essentially can be written equivalently like this and this quantity which we have here z mutual is reciprocal quantity that means whatever is the mutual coupling between this antenna and this antenna if you transmit this and receive this i have this mutual impedance the same thing is true when you transmit this and receive from this antenna so z mutual is a parameter which is independent of direction that means from which antenna is transmitting and receiving this z mutual quantity is same from the reciprocity theorem then beyond this then we can essentially use the circuit analysis to find out how much power 
is transmitted and so on. So, firstly, if the current which is flowing into this circuit is I1 and this is Z mutual, that means this tells me what is the voltage induced into this because of this current, that is what is the thing which is given by Z mutual. So, Z OC is Z mutual into I1. So, by definition, I get the open circuit voltage VOC is equal to Z mutual into I1. And then for complex conjugate match load, which is Z2 is equal to R2 plus Jx2, the maximum power transferred will be mod V square upon 4 R2. So, we have now the power received P L will be equal to mod V O C square upon 4 R 2, which is equal to mod Z mutual square mod I 1 square upon 4 R 2. How much is the power transmitted by the antenna? The power transmitted by the antenna corresponds to the radiation resistance of this antenna. So, if I say Z1 is R1 plus Jx1, then the power transferred will be mod I1 square into, into R1. So, we have power transmitted by the antenna. P t that will be equal to mod I 1 square into R 1. Now, this power goes into the space induces a voltage here that we have travelled a distance of R and as we have seen from the antenna there is a spherical wave which is created by the antenna. So, you are having a power density which varies as total power divided by 4 pi r square if the antenna is isotropic. If the antenna has a directivity, then the power density will be enhanced by directivity in the maximum direction. So, if I say that these two antenna systems are perfectly aligned to look into each other for maximum radiation, that means they are completely matched again in terms of their radiation patterns. The power density which you get on location of the receiving antenna will be total power divided by 4 pi r square into the directivity of this antenna. So, let us say directivity of antenna 1 is given by d 1. So, I will get the power density at the receiving antenna. that is S that will be equal to the power radiated multiplied by directivity d 1 divided by 4 pi r square. I can substitute for P t. So, this will be equal to mod I 1 square r 1 into d 1 upon 4 pi r square. Now, as you define the P L by S that is the effective aperture. So, I can I can write the power received from this will be the effective aperture into the power density. So, essentially what I can get the effective aperture multiplied by this power density that should give me the power received and that power received should be same as this power which is delivered to the load. So, from here I can I can get power 
received by receiving antenna that will be equal to the power density multiplied by the effective aperture of antenna 2. So, note here in this case the receiving antenna is 2 transmitting antenna is 1. So, 1 has a directivity parameter the receiving antenna has effective parameter which is effective aperture and that we are calling as A2. So, this antenna is having effective area which is A2. So, I can substitute now for for S. So, this quantity would be mod I1 square R1 D1 upon 4 pi R square into effective area for aperture 2 or antenna 2. Now, as we said this received power must be same as the power which is delivered to the load under fully matched condition. So, we can equate these two to get z mutual square mod i 1 square divided by 4 r 2 that is equal to this quantity which is mod i 1 square r 1 d 1 a 2 divided by 4 pi r square. From here I can calculate this quantity z mutual. So, I get from here z mutual square i 1 square will cancel. So, you will get 4, 4 will cancel with this. So, you will get r 1 r 2 d 1 a e 2 divided by pi r square. Now, let us interchange the role of the receiving and transmitting antenna. That means, now this is the one which is transmitting. So, it has a directivity let us say is d 2 and this antenna is the receiving antenna. So, it is aperture let us say is having a 1 and z, z mutual parameter which we have defined which is the mutual impedance between the two antenna is same whether this is transmitting or this is transmitting. So, I can calculate this quantity z mutual now from taking this antenna as transmitting and this antenna as receiving antenna. If I do that then z mutual will be this r 1 r 2 r they will remain same d 1 will be replaced by d 2 because now that is the transmitting antenna a e 2 will be replaced by a e 1 because that is the receiving antenna now. So, interchanging the role of transmitting and receiving antenna or let us say interchanging roles of antenna 1 and 2 that means, now 2 is transmitting antenna and 1 is receiving antenna we can get z mutual square that is r 1 r 2 d 2 a e 1 divided by pi r square. That means, this quantity d 1 a e 2 is equal to d 2 e a e 1. So, from here we essentially get d 1 a e 2 is equal to d 2 a e 1 that is d 1 upon a e 1 is equal to d 2 upon a e 2. 
Now, since we have not considered here a specific antenna, this relation that the directivity of an antenna and the effective aperture, this ratio of these two must be independent of what antenna we which uh, antenna pair we choose. That means this quantity d or directivity of an antenna and this effective aperture, this quantity must be a constant quantity. Because this ratio now is independent of which antenna pair you take. So, this quantity must be con some constant, let us say k, whose value if we ev evaluate for one antenna, then essentially we got a relationship between directivity and the effective aperture in general for any antenna. So, first thing what we note from this derivation that is for an antenna is directivity and the effective aperture, they are directly proportional to each other through this constant k and that constant k we can evaluate by finding out the directivity on effective aperture for any one antenna. And since we have investigated the simplest antenna which is the Hertz dipole, maybe we can calculate the value of d and a 1 for the Hertz dipole and from there we can calculate the value of k. So, let us say for Hertz dipole, we have a radiation pattern E which will be given by sin of theta. So, we have a directivity for the Hertz dipole D which is 4 pi divided by theta 0 to pi phi 0 to 2 pi mod E square. Now, this pattern is normalized pattern, this maximum value is 1. So, this is mod E square which is sin square theta and the solid angle sin theta d theta d phi. And this integral we had we had calculated earlier. So, this quantity this will give me 2 pi over, over phi. So, this is 4 pi upon 2 pi integral 0 to pi sin cube theta d theta. And this integral we had evaluated which was 4 by 3. So, if I substitute that this is 2 upon 4 by 3 that is equal to 3 by 2. So, the directivity of the Hertz dipole is 3 by 2. We can calculate the effective aperture also for the Hertz dipole when the wave is incident so that the maximum voltage is induced. So, let us say we have a Hertz dipole and the wave which is incident from the maximum direction which is this direction has an electric field which is E. So, the pointing vector s for this will be mod E square upon eta, where eta is the intrinsic impedance of the medium. So, which is equal to mod E square divided by 120 pi, where 120 pi is the intrinsic impedance of the medium. What is the voltage induced because of this electric field in this, which is E dot d L. So, if the length of this first dipole is let us say L, then the V O C from here, V O C open circuit voltage that will be equal to E into L. Everything is matched, polarization is also matched. So, dot product is the maximum dot product which is E into L. Now, if I look into the terminal of the Hertz dipole, we see a resistance which is nothing but the radiation resistance which we already derived. So, this is equivalent to essentially a voltage source 
and a resistance which is the radiation resistance. So, the maximum power which I can extract now from here that is P L from this antenna that will be mod V O C square divided by 4 resistance which is nothing but the radiation resistance of the Hertz dipole. I can substitute for V O C which is mod E square L square upon 4 and radiation resistance is 80 pi square that is what we have derived. So, this is 80 pi square lambda upon L whole square. The radiation resistance is 80 pi square L upon lambda whole square. So, now I know the pointing vector of this the wave which is coming and incident on the antenna. I also know the power which can be maximally extracted from the Hertz dipole which is which is given by this. So, for this antenna the effective aperture A effective will be P L divided by the pointing vector. So, that will be the E square will cancel the L square has cancelled with this. So, I get from here lambda square three upon eight lambda square upon pi. Firstly, the interesting thing to note here is that for the Hertz dipole, the effective aperture is independent of the length of the dipole. You see nowhere the length is coming into picture. That means, as long as the current is uniform across the dipole, the assumption of Hertz dipole is valid. The effective aperture has nothing to do with the physical size of the antenna. That is a very interesting property of the Hertz dipole. And same is true also for the directivity of the of the Hertz dipole. The directivity also is not a function of the length of the antenna. So, both these quantities for the Hertz dipole the directivity and the effective aperture they are not functions of the physical size of the antenna. Second interesting thing to note here is that the effective aperture essentially scales as lambda square. So, for a given antenna since the length is not coming into picture as I decrease the frequency of the antenna that means, if as the wavelength increases the effective aperture of the antenna goes on increasing. So, if I take a small piece of wire and as the frequency decreases essentially lambda is the one which is going to increase and the effective aperture which is offered by the antenna will, will increase and that is a very interesting characteristic of the Hertz dipole. However, now solving these two that getting this quantity the directivity for the Hertz dipole which is 3 by 2 and the effective aperture which is which is this then I can substitute into this relation and find out this constant k the proportionality constant. So, we get now the proportionality constant k that is the directivity which is 3 upon 2 divided by the effective aperture which is 3 by 8 lambda square upon pi. Three will cancel, two will cancel. So I'll get four pi. So this will be equal to four pi upon lambda square. Then one can substitute here, and I can get a general relation between the directivity and the effective aperture for any antenna, and that will be the directivity upon the effective aperture for an antenna 
that will be equal to 4 pi upon lambda square or the directivity is equal to 4 pi effective aperture upon lambda square. This is the relation which essentially relates the effective aperture of an antenna and the directivity of the antenna. And as we have seen that there is a proportionality relationship that means larger the directivity of the antenna, higher will be the effective aperture of the antenna. And directivity is related to the beam width of the antenna that means narrower the beam of the antenna, higher will be the effective aperture of the antenna. Now, although we have derived this relationship for the maximum direction which was which was picking up the maximum radiation and that is where directivity was coming into picture. If we had to define a parameter what is called a directive gain which is the ratio of the radiation intensity in the that direction divided by the average radiation intensity then also this relation would be true only thing this quantity will not be directivity this will be directive gain in that particular antenna. So, now we can say that when antenna is given of course, when everything is matched I get effective aperture I get directivity of the antenna, but then I can say that well if I do not have a radiation coming from the direction of maximum reception, but suppose it was coming from some arbitrary direction antenna is not going to respond maximally and so was the case when the antenna was transmitting it would not have transmitted maximum field in that direction but it would have given me some enhancement or decrease in that direction which I called a directive gain. So, if the antenna is receiving a wave from some angle theta phi. So, let us say I have some antenna here and the wave is coming from some angle which is theta and phi. So, then I can define the effective aperture which the antenna offers to this wave coming from theta phi direction that effective aperture is E which is a function of theta phi and I have a directive gain also for this antenna when the antenna is transmitting which has a variation which is theta phi. This relation is true for any direction and for any antenna. So, we can say that the directive gain of any, any antenna is equal to 4 pi effective aperture for that direction divided by lambda square. When we take a direction which is for the maximum reception or maximum radiation the g will become equal to directivity this will become the effective aperture of the antenna for maximum radiation that will give me essentially this relation which is this. So, the relationship between the directive gain this quantity we can call then as the directive gain maximum value of g theta phi is nothing but your directivity. by definition. So, this relation is a very useful relation in the antenna analysis because it relates essentially the parameters of an antenna when in transmitting mode and its parameter when the antenna is in receiving mode. So, this uh, relationship comes very handy when essentially we do the calculation uh, for the for the antennas in transmitting and receiving modes. Just to take an example here if I take a parabolic dish and find out what would be the effective aperture and the directivity of an antenna. So, let us say if I take a simple parabolic dish which is circular and which is having let us say a diameter which is diameter d. The beam which is produced by this antenna 
is approximately in radians it is lambda upon d so you get theta produced by this will be approximately the beam width or the half power beam width will be lambda upon d radians this is circular beam so i can get the area of this of this beam essentially pi into theta upon 2 whole square so i can get now the directivity for this antenna which will be equal to 4 pi upon the solid angle of the beam which is approximately pi into lambda upon 2d whole square so from here the pi will cancel so this you will get 4 into 16 d square upon lambda square so what should be the effective aperture of this antenna a effective that will be equal to lambda square upon 4 pi into d so that is equal to lambda square upon 4 pi into the directivity of the antenna which is 16 d square upon lambda square lambda square will cancel so this will be equal to sixteen upon four pi into d square. So this quantity if you if you if you see it is close to about d square and so is the physical area if I calculate it is pi upon four d square. So this quantity now is very close or if I if I if I cancel this, this will become four. So this will be equal to four d square upon pi. So the physical area of this parabolic dish is very close to the effective aperture for for this antenna. However, as I mentioned, this relationship is only true for the antennas which are having aperture kind of thing. In general, when I take a dipole which are like which are very thin the physical area is very very small but its effective area could be large depending upon its directivity or the length of the dipole and so on. So this relation which we derived today between the directivity of an antenna and the effective aperture is an extremely important relation because using this relation then I can go from properties of a transmitting antenna to the receiving antenna and vice versa.